Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus webinar entitled Asian Carp, Invasive Species, and the Great Lakes, Next Steps and Prevention Strategies. This is the first webinar of the caucus's Great Lakes Great Webinar Series in 2014. I'm Lisa Hanairo with the Council of State Governments Midwestern Office. I staff the caucus and I'm managing the logistics for this webinar. We'll start with a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded. The slides from the presentations and the recording will be posted on the caucus's website this afternoon at the address you see on the screen. You'll receive a follow-up message with a link to the recording and also the address where you can find both the recording and the slides. To reduce the possibility of feedback or other external noise, while the presentations are running, the conference will be in listen-only mode. After each presentation, we'll open up the line for questions. We want this webinar to be interactive, so if you have a question, please let us know either by typing um, your question in the GoToWebinar questions pane or by clicking on the hand icon to raise your hand. If I see that your hand is raised, I'll unmute your line so that you can ask your question. If you accidentally click on the button to raise your hand, just click it again and it'll turn off. Next, a few tips if you do plan to ask a question. If you're using your telephone, please make sure to enter your audio PIN, which you'll find in the audio pane. Press pound, then the two-digit number, and then pound again. If you selected voice over IP and are using your computer's microphone and speakers, please test your settings by clicking on the test settings link in the audio pane. Your connection to the webinar audience will be muted, so don't worry about anyone hearing you as you test your microphone. If your computer's microphone doesn't appear to be working, you should call in using one of the telephone numbers listed in the audio pane and then make sure to ent enter your two-digit PIN. And finally, after the webinar, you'll all be asked to take a very brief survey, just three questions. Please take the time to fill out the survey so we can get feedback to help us improve our webinars. Now I will turn the floor over to the chair of the caucus, Minnesota Senator Ann Rest. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and, working, and welcome, everyone. Our Great Lakes Great Webinar Series for 2014 begins today with a webinar on the future of this region's efforts to prevent Asian carp from reaching the Great Lakes, with a focus on what is being done or can be done to stop this destructive invasive species from reaching Lake Michigan via the Chicago area waterway system. In part, this webinar will explore the options laid out by the U.S. Army, uh, US Army Corps of Engineers in its much-anticipated study that was released earlier this year. That study is the Great Lakes Mississippi River Interbasin Study, or GLIMRIS, as it's uh, commonly referred to. The Army Corps of Engineers is currently holding public meetings throughout the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Basin to solicit public import on the study's findings. Today's webinar will help members of the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus decide whether the caucus should consider submitting comments on the study and more about that later. Before we get into the presentations, I thought it would be important to say a few words about the caucus for those of you who are new members or are considering en enrolling as members. The Great Lakes Legislative Caucus is a nonpartisan state and provincial lawmakers from the Great Lakes region, bringing together members from the eight uh, U.S. Great Lakes states and the two Canadian provinces of uh, Quebec and Ontario. The caucus has three primary goals. First, to facilitate the regional exchange of ideas and information on key Great Lakes issues, which we do through these webinars and at our annual meeting. Secondly, to strengthen the role of state and provincial legislators in the policy making process. And then third, and most importantly, to promote the restoration and protection of the Great Lakes. The caucus was organized in 2003, and we've had annual meetings since then. At the end of today's webinar, I'll say a few words about the 2014 annual meeting, which will take place this July in Quebec. Membership in the caucus is at all legislators in the Great Lakes states and provinces. If you are a legislator and would like to enroll as a member, please visit the link you see on the screen or go to the caucus's website and click, and click on the membership tab. We are very pleased today to have two distinguished speakers with us. Our first speaker will be Joel Brammeyer, 
President and CEO of the Alliance for the Great Lakes. Mr. Graham Meyer is a leading advocate of an expert in Great Lakes protection and restoration policy. He was um, also one of the authors of a first-of-its-kind report examining options to permanently separate the Great Lakes and Mississippi River systems. One of the options proposed in the recent Army Corps study, um, Joel will discuss that study as well as potential next steps and strategies for the Great Lakes region. Our second speaker will be Jim Breeden, Asian Carp Deputy Director for the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Mr. Breeden also works for the state of Michigan in its Office of the Great Lakes. He will update the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus on the ongoing work of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating I thank both of them for being with us this morning, and I'll now turn the floor over to Joel Bramar. Thank you, Senator Rust, and good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, uh, Lisa, the presentation is coming through okay? Yes, we can see okay, it just well, fine. We'll proceed. Um, my name is Joel Bremeyer, and I wanted to also, before I get started today, put in a, a quick plug for the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus. Um, we really appreciate the caucus's work uh, to inform state legislators around the Great Lakes region about what's happening uh, in the Great Lakes and uh, emphasize the opportunities for state elected officials to play a role in, in the protection and restoration of the lakes. So thank you um, for, that, for that effort. What I want to talk about today uh, in about 15 minutes is uh, the CARP, the Army Corps, and the Chicago Waterway. Um, I'm going to be going over a lot of information in a very short time, and so uh, I may uh, go by some details about the plans that are being proposed, and feel free to raise questions you have uh, that I did not cover uh, in, in, the, uh, in the comments after the presentation. So I wanted to do a little reminder of why we're all here uh, today. And the Asian carp, more specifically the big head and silver carp species, are of the greatest concern to the Great Lakes region right now. These two species are moving toward the Great Lakes uh, up the Illinois River, and at their closest have been found to attempt to spawn about 60 miles from Lake Michigan. The Great Lakes region is deeply concerned over the movement of this fish, or these fish, because they are prolific spawners. Uh, they, can, they breed uh, much faster than native Great Lakes fish. Uh, they eat uh, much more efficiently than Great Lakes fish, and so have the potential to really decimate the food web uh, for native species in the Great Lakes. And most visibly, as many of you are probably familiar with, they jump out of the water when disturbed by a passing boat. And so um, that can actually cause direct harm to boaters uh, and in fact, uh, it, it was interesting to see that the Attorney General of the state of Indiana actually came to a, a uh, public meeting about the recent core study in Chicago, not because of his concern over the uh, carp entering Lake Michigan, uh, but because of his concern with uh, the, uh, the decimation of recreational activity on the Wabash River in Indiana, um, one of the rivers south of the Great Lakes that is currently being impacted by the Asian carp. So when we're talking about invasive species, um, the risk of, of doing nothing uh, is, is, is untenable. And that's why we recommend pursuing a policy of prevention. Uh, preventing a new invasion is usually possible, particularly with the tools that we have to look around the world and see where live organisms may be coming from that could impact the Great Lakes. That's usually something that we can do in this day and age. But controlling an invasion once it's arrived is typically impossible. Um, we have the occasional fortunate success story like the sea lamprey in the Great Lakes, um, but far more often than not, once a new invasive species is established, control is, is just about impossible. And that's why when you see a, a fish coming like the silver carp and the big head carp, the best thing to do is to keep them out in the first place. This isn't just about the ecology, it's also about the economy. The University of Notre Dame estimates that about $200 million in losses is being caused still to the Great Lakes annually just by the uh, invasive species that are here uh, because, of ship because of shipping. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in annual impact uh, estimated being caused to the Great Lakes overall by the Nature Conservancy. 
In this report, the Army Corps of Engineers focused on 13 high-risk species, not just the Asian carp, even though that's the one that many of us are very concerned about, but 13 species that are at risk of moving in both directions between the Great Lakes and Mississippi River. So while we're concerned in the Great Lakes about the Asian carp, um, there are nearly a dozen uh, high-risk species that are threatening to move into the Mississippi River from the Great Lakes. And so uh, what the Corps was looking at is how do we pursue a two-way protection for both of these great watersheds? How do we have invasive species moving from in, in both directions? Now what I'm going to do next is run through uh, the eight options that the Corps presented, and I'm going to do this pretty quickly. Uh, what I'm going to focus on are the, is the broad picture of what each of these options is about, and then talk to you about how well each of the options stops invasive species. You see that little star at the bottom of your screen? Um, those star ratings were actually assigned by the Army Corps of Engineers to each of the eight options. Um, and so when you see uh, one to four stars, it tells you how effective this option is at stopping invasive species. Um, the, the option one, the, the no new federal action or the no action alternative, uh, I think for anybody who's, who's spent even a little time around this issue is really uh, not an option at all. And so, um, of course, this gets the one star rating. Um, the next uh, option the Corps explored was what they called non-structural. Non-structural simply means we don't build anything new in the waterways to stop invasive species. Um, and so this really relies on education, uh, monitoring, uh, use of pesticides or fish poisons to, to occasionally kill off stretches of river, um, and, and manage, the, manage the, the threat without actually building anything new. And you see the two-star rating here. Um, I don't think that this, in the long term, is really something that anybody feels is a permanent solution uh, either. So moving on to uh, two options that look very similar to each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this was option three, and uh, in this, uh, in this, is a, uh, a set of, uh, a set of uh, major mitigation needs. And, and those purple circles you see on your screen are actually representative of new reservoirs that would need to be built for flood control. Because of the operation, because of the way that these locks would operate, it would necessitate the addition of, of additional flood control to the Chicago area, uh, which would also um, drive up uh, the price tag. The next option, option four, is, is very similar uh, to the one I just showed you, except that the, uh, the glimmerous locks are implemented in, in different places. Uh, and so what you see here is a combination of, of, of physical barriers in some places where uh, the waterways aren't used for navigation, such as the Grand Calumet River in Indiana, and a number of glimmerous locks features built into the waterway uh, that, again, were, were, were designed for the purpose of allowing navigation to continue uh, while attempting to stop the movement of invasive species through a lock through a combination of technologies such as um, uh, uh, electrical barriers, uh, pump changing the way that water is pumped through the system, uh, water treatment to chemically cleanse the water to ensure that it's free of invasive species and those kinds of things. Again, I want to emphasize this glimmerous lock concept would be a, is a brand new idea that's being brought to the court, by the court to the table. It hasn't been done anywhere yet, uh, and so it would be subject to substantial uh, a, a additional engineering design um, and construction time. And the court estimated that these two options would, would give about a three star out of four level of, of re risk reduction for the stopping the movement of invasive species between the Great Lakes and Mississippi River. 
Option five uh, and, the, and the next option both explore complete hydrologic separation of the Great Lakes and the Mississippi. And, and hydrologic separation simply means uh, putting a wall, a physical barrier in the waterway to stop the movement of water between the two, between the two watersheds. Um, this is an option that, uh, that, that my organization, the Alliance for the Great Lakes, has been advocating for for, uh, uh, for, for many years, um, and one that some other uh, entities in the Great Lakes Basin have been exploring. And I'll talk about that a little more later. Hydrologic separation, as you can see, uh, has the highest certainty of stopping the movement of invasive species through the canals. Unsurprisingly, a, a wall is the best way to stop live organisms from moving through, uh, through a waterway. Uh, what you see here in the in the red dots in, on this picture are places where those walls would need to be located for this option. And again, you see the purple circles are where additional flood control reservoirs would have to be placed. Now, I want to mention particularly on this option, um, the the idea of cutting off Lake Michigan from the Chicago River entirely, which is which is what would happen uh, in this, is not something that I, I, I don't think anybody, uh, any stakeholders in any part of this conversation have been recommending. And so, um, for, by by my read, regardless of, of the dollars, which I'll talk about in a bit, this this option really is a non-starter. Um, the mid-system hydrologic separation explores the same concept of using physical barriers, but it does so in a way that I think is much more amenable to the, to the current and future uses of the Chicago River and Lake Michigan. In this case, the red dots represent physical barriers, the, the purple circles represent flood mitigation, um, and what, it, what this option would do is it would leave uh, large parts of the Chicago River uh, and the Calumet River, which is located on the south side of Chicago, uh, open to navigation, um, and it would and it would allow the Chicago River and the Calumet River to be reconnected to Lake Michigan in a way uh, that mimics some of the natural feature of this part of the Great Lakes. Again, um, this is a four-star rated option, meaning that this carries the best, the greatest potential to actually stop invasive species moving back and forth. Um, and, uh, and th that is something that both uh, hydrologic separation concepts have in common. The last two options the Corps explored go back down to the three-star three rating. And these are really a combination of the two uh, types of approaches I mentioned so far. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll broadly categorize those as the lock approach, the glimmerous lock approach, that, that lock with lots of technology and physical separation, building walls. These last two options really explore a hybrid approach of putting a wall in one part of the system and building a glimmerous lock in another part. Uh, and so um, in exploring the combination of options, um, what the core has, has discovered is that um, the hybrid option uh, doesn't really save a lot of money over the, over the, uh, the previous uh, lock-focused options. Um, and uh, it doesn't actually increase the, uh, the effectiveness of the project, meaning that it doesn't actually get us closer to that four-star uh, rating of effectiveness. Now, having said that, there's still quite a lot of gray area in the, in the way that the court analyzed these options, and so um, more study and more information will certainly, may certainly uh, change that picture. And I'll just, uh, option eight is simply uh, the, the previous option, number seven, with the features in a different location, but it doesn't substantially change um, the cost or the risk reduction profile of this option. So that's a very brief summary of, of the core's uh, eight approaches to solving this problem. Um, I'll emphasize that you know, if your primary concern is stopping, is stopping uh, invasive species from moving, certainly a physical barrier uh, is, is the best way to do that. Um, that brings with it uh, a number of other uh, questions about how you deal with the consequences of that choice, and I want to and I want to talk a little bit about those right now. Um, so, uh, what some of the significant features of these projects, and and, and and they have many of these projects have these in common. Um, certainly, when the when the Glenris report came out, there was quite a lot of, of chatter and headlines about the idea of something costing eighteen billion dollars or and taking twenty five years. Um, in fact, if you look at the report, what you'll find is that all of the options that have a meaningful chance of, of drastically reducing the risk or preventing the movement of Asian carp and other species into the Great Lakes are, are pegged to cost a lot of money. And a lot of assumptions went into those dollar, those dollar figures um, that, that I 
happens if they don't really hold up under inspection. And I'll talk about that in my next slide. Um, where did those dollars come from? Well, some of the features that, are, that the core are focused on I've, I've outlined here. Physical barriers I talked a bit about already. Um, building a physical barrier, by the way, uh, really doesn't cost very much. Uh, it's the consequence of building that barrier when you have to start thinking about um, uh, some mitigation steps and how much those are going to cost. One of the things that the Corps highlighted in its report was the need for the dredging of the Chicago River in the event that separation occurs. And um, uh, this, was, uh, this is an interesting point because it, it dramatically drives up the cost of, of that option. And it's not clear uh, yet exactly why the cost of that dredging would have to be built into the cost of protecting the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River from invasive species. Um, likewise, the core explores this idea of a swimmer's lock that I mentioned. And, and again, this is a this is a uh, option uh, that has not been built anywhere yet. Uh, would have to be designed from the ground up uh, for this project, and also costs in the billion dollar plus range per application. The core explored the idea of the need for new reservoirs, meaning that um, Chicago is built uh, basically on a massive swamp. And that means the, water, the level of uh, the land is very flat, and the area is very prone to flooding. Um, uh, the core made some assumptions about the need for storing uh, flood water in new reservoirs, because that water uh, couldn't be uh, managed in some other way. Those assumptions also drove up the cost of the projects that the core explored dramatically. And, and the core also explored the need for new water treatment plants um, to be built at a number of locations uh, within these scenarios. Again, a very expensive, a very expensive uh, feature. So let's talk about those assumptions a little bit, because um, I think it's important for our Great Lakes region um, and for the Mississippi River region, looking at this report, to understand that um, a great deal of the cost being built into these options is not to do with um, the building of physical barriers. It's to do with the assumptions that the core is making about the consequences of that choice. Um, as I mentioned already, there's a, there's a huge assumption built in that if the, if the Chicago River is reconnected to Lake Michigan, uh, the entire Chicago River will have to be dredged. That is, I, I'm estimating, about a $3 billion assumption. Um, that the Corps is making in this report. So it's a massive, massive uh, uh, player in, those, in the final cost figures. And digging into exactly why that's being required um, for this kind of a project is very important. Uh, the Corps is making the assumption that uh, no, uh, effectively no new uh, discharge of water to Lake Michigan, uh, other than drinking water quality water, is going to be allowed. Um, and the, of course, this, this uh, contrasts to the way that the Chicago River, the Illinois River, and the Mississippi River are currently being treated. Um, in fact, we are, we are in the Chicago area uh, discharging large quantities of combined sewer overflows and other pollutants to the Chicago River and into the Illinois and Mississippi River um, every day right now. Um, and so the, the, this study actually sets up a very, very um, uh, unbalanced way of looking at our responsibility for keeping water clean on, on, the, on the southern side of a barrier versus the northern side. The Corps is also assuming that we are planning for a 500-year storm event. And, and this is a standard of, of flood control uh, and mitigation that no other uh, Great Lakes city is, is, is planning to at this, at, at this moment. Um, it, again, uh, this assumption and the amount of water that would have to be managed for that assumption drives up the cost of construction of reservoirs and mitigation methods uh, dramatically. Uh, and so we're not clear on why that assumption is made either. Um, the Corps also has uh, basically ignored the benefits created by any of these projects. Um, there's been a great deal of focus on the cost of construction. Um, and, but there hasn't been uh, a balanced focus on the benefits to the Great Lakes region in the, in the form of the avoided costs of invasive species, costs which I uh, talked to you earlier about in the hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Uh, nor has, did they attempt to measure the benefits of, of cleaning up uh, water in the Chicago area, 
uh, providing improved flood control and improved transportation options uh, for northeastern Illinois and northwest Indiana. None of those benefits were actually figured into the course analysis. And so we have a very, again, unbalanced view of what it would actually cost to make some of these changes. And finally, we bundled all these assumptions up and, and we charged them all to the cost of preventing invasive species. Um, and, 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 and simply put, um, uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, I'm not sure that it's fair to put all of these uh, new costs on the backs of stopping the Asian carp and other and other species from moving between uh, these two basins. We've got to take a hard look at those numbers, understand the assumptions, and see what other alternatives might be out there. And that's why I'm excited uh, to know that some of some of the work that's gone before has had a little bit of a different take. Um, the Great Lakes Commission and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative in 2012 actually have put out a study looking at separation from a different angle and came up with a cost estimate of about $4 billion, which is still substantial, um, but substantially lower than what the, core, uh, what the core is looking at. And so what do we do now? Um, one, number one, learn from history, don't repeat it. Uh, 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 just looking back a bit, the electrical barrier that everybody is currently relying on as the last line of defense for the Great Lakes was authorized by Congress in 1996. It is 2014, and we've just found out that the barrier is actually not effective at, the, at, at uh, stopping the movement of small fish, um, small fish to, into uh, into Lake Michigan. Um, so I would encourage everybody to think about what we can do differently um, than what we did uh, with that particular project. To that end, I think it's really important that we focus on adding uh, local and regional co-leadership to this process with Congress and the Corps. Um, I don't, my read on the, on the Corps' report is that the Corps doesn't feel it can lead on choosing a solution. And that means that we've got to take control of this process and decide what we want to recommend as a way to protect the Great Lakes. We need to act now to reduce risk, but keep it simple. Let's not get bogged down in a, in a, in a very uh, long-term uh, project that's just about reducing risk in the short term. Um, we should be able to build new things in the river uh, within the next uh, two years in order to get a, an increased level of prevention. Um, and I want to emphasize that permanent two-way prevention really remains the objective. Um, notwithstanding uh, any of the urgency around the Asian carp and, the, and their movement toward Lake Michigan, um, this is really a project about stopping uh, a, a constant threat to the Great Lakes and a constant threat to the Mississippi River. And the only thing that's going to stop that is true prevention working in both directions. Um, again, I'll emphasize that separation is the most effective uh, way of stopping invasive species movement. Um, and as, as Senator Rest mentioned in her uh, opening, the Army Corps is taking comments uh, on this study uh, until March 31st, and I would encourage anybody who's interested to work with the caucus um, to develop their to develop their thoughts on the matter. Uh, with that, I'll stop and turn things back over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Joel. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joel. Um, we do have maybe a couple minutes for uh, questions, and uh, please remember to raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon or typing your um, your question. Uh, are there any questions now, or you can also see Joel's uh, contact information to uh, raise questions with him later. Are there any questions? I'm looking now. We do have one hand raised. Well, nope, that hand just disappeared. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you wanted to ask a question, please remember to click on the little icon that looks like a hand, and then I can unmute your line. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to hear your question. Uh, you, you can also um, type your question into the questions pane if you'd like. Lisa, can you I hear have, me? I have, just a, I have just a quick question about um, the public comment. Um, are the public comments uh, published uh, as they are uh, presented, and um, what is the tenor of them been if you have been following them? Certainly. Uh, I think uh, Jim can probably answer the first question, although I can tell you that the Army Corps of Engineers made it clear in their public meetings that they're not going to change anything in the report based on public comments. The, the comments will be recorded and compiled uh, as a separate product after the comment period is over. 
Uh, in terms of the tenor of the comments, um, I or, or uh, somebody on my staff or somebody I know have been to uh, all of the public meetings thus far. And I, I would say that uh, universally, nobody wants to see Asian carp get in the Great Lakes. Uh, universally, um, uh, outside of Southern Lake Michigan, uh, separation is, is being called out as the preferred option. Uh, and um, also, I hear a lot. Uh, people talking about getting this done much faster than what the core uh, has, has proposed. Mm -hmm. An engineer who was at the meeting in Cleveland actually mentioned that if he told his boss he couldn't get something done in less than 10 years, um, he'd probably be fired, which I thought was an interesting comment. Um, interesting. Uh, I also, though, I want to mention clearly, too, in Illinois, where the core held its first public meeting, uh, where this has been a very controversial uh, conversation, uh, it was very well attended. More than 100 people were there. Um, the majority of the people speaking at that meeting um, spoke uh, in favor of separating the two basins. Uh, abs there were certainly some other concerns expressed there by, by people who are using the rivers right now. Um, but e even in Chicago, uh, I was uh, impressed to see the concern over the protection of the Great Lakes and Mississippi River really being uh, uh, right out front, uh, number one on people's minds. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, we, we uh, do have a couple. Senator Ress, we do have a couple of questions. I wanted to see if Jim... No, um, I, but I just wanted to make sure that we uh, are leaving enough time for uh, Jim to make his presentation. But uh, if there are a couple of quick questions out there, perhaps we can take them. Okay, we just have two, and we have a clarification that uh, comments on the study are due by March 3rd, apparently, not uh, the 31st. Um, we'll go okay. to the, the questioners. Uh, Patty uh, Bellock, I see your hand is raised, so I'm opening your line. Go ahead with your question, please. Okay, well, we'll try Susan Evans. Susan Evans, your line is open now. I'm sorry, Susan, we can't, can't hear your question. Maybe your um, computer's microphone doesn't work. If you, we'll, we'll move on now to the um, uh, next presentation, unless, Tim, I, I thought I heard you trying to ask a quick question. Uh, no, that's okay. We can move on. Um, um, okay. Okay, great. And if anybody does have a question um, for Joel or for Jim, please uh, type it in the questions pane unless you're certain that your telephone um, has a, or I'm sorry, that your computer has a, a good microphone. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim's presentation. Thank you very much, Joel. I'm going to uh, mute your line and open up Jim's. Jim, whenever. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you, Senator Rest, and uh, to the caucus for inviting me to this webinar today. Uh, as Senator Rest mentioned, um, I'm Jim Breeden from the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, and I'm actually on loan to the White House from the Michigan Office of the Great Lakes. And today I'm sitting in my office in Grand Haven, Michigan, uh, making this presentation. So. Uh, uh, I just want to give you that kind of perspective from uh, my standpoint. Are you set, Lisa? Your slides are showing. Um, Kathy, press S F5 on your computer to go into slideshow mode. Lisa, the, the, the slideshow mode, it doesn't show up when it goes in the slideshow mode, so we're going to have to do it like this. Um, okay. We're going to have to do it like this. Well, while you guys are working on that, why don't I just go ahead and, uh, and start the presentation. Um, what I'd like to do is, Joel just gave you a summary of the glimmerous uh, report with a focus on Asian carp. What I want to do is to give you the perspective of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee and where we're going, what we've been doing, um, and how Glimmers fits into our process. So I, I know John Goss has been on this call uh, with the caucus in previous years, uh, but I want to remind everybody that the Asian Carp um, 
Regional Coordinating Committee is a, is a group of federal, state, lo and local agencies with private stakeholders and citizens. And, citizens. Um, and we're working to prevent the establishment of an Asian car population in the Great Lakes. So that's our focus. Now, Glimmerus is dealing with all invasive species. Our focus, again, is simply on Asian carp. So Lisa, next slide. Uh, Kathy, go to the next slide, please. Jim, Kathy is running your slides. If you okay, press you. the down arrow key, Kathy, it'll go forward. Sorry, but it's just not working in the slide mode. We're going to, the computer's freezing up. Okay, I think we've got it to the next slide. Okay, um, just so everybody knows, the, this is the, regional, the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee. We have a federal executive committee, and we have uh, the Regional Coordinating Committee, and as you can see there, we have representation from um, all of the uh, appropriate federal agencies, all eight Great Lakes states, um, the City of Chicago, in, um, in the Chicago Municipal Water Reclamation District, and in 2012, we did add uh, Canada, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. So next slide, Kathy. Okay, this is a map just to remind everybody as to where Asian carp have been found. Um, the green is, the, uh, is where the adults have been found. And the pink, at least it's showing up pink on mine, is um, where we found young of the year or uh, eggs of Asian carp. So you can see uh, they've pretty much made their way up the Mississippi River um, through the Illinois. They are now moving into the Ohio River, um, up the Missouri River, um, and in uh, northern Minnesota. Um, so that, this is just our compilation of where we have found Asian carp to date. Next slide, Kathy. Um, as Joel mentioned, um, we, we, we do track, we, do, we have a significant amount of monitoring that's going on regarding Asian carp. And if you can look up in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a, a yellow star. Um, that's where the electrical barrier is, and, and, and farther up is Lake Michigan. Um, and what this map portrays is where we have been seeing uh, in the Illinois River, uh, the populate the adult population front, and then also the uh, uh, where we found spawning. So the yellow area is where we have found the adult population. So they've been basically up into the Dresden Island, Lock and Dam area, um, and uh, and just this last year we did see some observed spawning in that kind of the reddish area area. Uh, we have not been able to document that it, this has been. Um, effective spawning. Uh, we haven't seen any young of the year or um, in that area, but if you get farther down into the pink area, um, that's where we have seen actual spawning of uh, both silver and big head carp. The most important thing about this map is that this is the map that we've been showing everyone for about four to five years now. And what I mean by that is the, the Asian carp front moving north really hasn't moved in about four to five years. Um, we don't know why. Uh, we haven't really been able to figure out um, why, the, why the fish haven't moved farther up closer to Lake Michigan. Um, we know that there are some significant lock and dams in this area that might be uh, prohibiting their movement. Um, and we know that the Chicago Area Waterway System is not a very friendly habitat. A fish fr it's not a fish friendly habitat. So, we're working right now to try to find out what's keeping the fish farther south. And this doesn't mean that fish won't move up, but at least over the last four or five years, we have not seen any significant movement of Asian carp, at least in this area. So, okay, you can move to the next one, Kathy. Um, but we, are, we, uh, we do understand that this is a very significant threat to the Great Lakes. And as such, we have a, a framework, an Asian carp control strategy framework that we develop on an annual basis. And there are basically four things in it that, that we focus on. We focus on the electrical barrier. And this year, 
Uh, we, we, there are actually three barriers, three electrical barriers. Um, uh, one of them was the original uh, demonstration barrier that was built in 2002. We are upgrading that barrier this year, so we will have three uh, effective electrical barriers um, in the area. We have extensive monitoring and response both upstream of the barriers and downstream. And we're in the process of developing new control technologies to try to uh, uh, slow down the movement or maybe possibly even uh, uh, kill Asian carp. And then we also have this development of our long-term solution, which is glimmerous. Next slide, Kathy. Um, in 2013, we have done, uh, as I mentioned, a significant amount of monitoring on both sides of the barrier to see if, if we are finding any fish upstream. We have not seen, there. we do not have any reports of live fish uh, north of the barrier. Um, and what, what we have here is if you go on to asiancarp.us, we have an annual monitoring and response plan uh, that's developed for the Chicago area waterway system. Um, and, and that plan is available for everybody to take a look at. Next slide, Kathy. I just want to remind everybody that that you know, this is the area that we were talking about, and and to show you specifically where the demonstration barrier is on the upper left-hand side, you can see I, it's kind of hard to read, but uh, the demonstration barrier is up at the top, and then there's barrier two B and two A. Two B and two A are the most recent barriers, uh, the ones that are very high quality. The demonstration barrier is the one that's being replaced um, in the next couple of years. Next slide. Um, I'd also like to mention that we have a very um, uh, uh, effective process with Illinois DNR where they are contracting with commercial fishers downstream of the barrier. What we're trying to do is remove as much fish as we can in that area close to the, the downstream area of the barrier so that we try to keep the fish from um, uh, moving upstream. So over the last year, uh, we've removed uh, 271 tons of fish. Um, and over the last three years, we're close to uh, 1,000 tons of fish of carp removed below the barrier. Next slide, Kathy. Um, I'd also like to point out that we are now in the process of monitoring the Great Lakes. Um, these circles that you see on here are areas where uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is working directly with the state agencies in monitoring to determine whether or not we, uh, we are finding any um, Asian carp or eDNA. If you remember, uh, some of you may have heard, we did find a, a sighting of uh, or a, um, a positive eDNA in Wisconsin waters as a result of the monitoring that was going on up in Green Bay. Uh, they went back and retested and, found, and could not find a, a, another positive, so we are not sure if that's a live fish or not. But this is the area, area of the Great Lakes that we are actively monitoring uh, with uh, uh, state agencies and federal agencies. Next slide. As I mentioned, what we're also doing, one of our key components of our strategy is looking at ways that we can either exclude, detect, attract, or remove Asian carp. Um, we're specifically looking at fish toxicants, um, possibly fish attractants where we can bring fish into an area and then capture them. We are looking at new net designs. Um, and we also have uh, the guy in the um, uh, upper right, he's holding a hydro gun uh, that sends out a pulse that uh, deters Asian carp from moving into the area. So we are actively looking uh, at new ways that we can keep Asian carp out of areas or possibly remove them altogether. Next slide, Kathy. Um, I'd like to turn to Glimmers real quickly. I don't want to go over what Joel um, mentioned, but there are some key issues here that I think are important. These, what I'm showing here are the technologies that the Corps of Engineers specifically looked at. And what they were trying to do was address three modes of movement by Asian carp. Asian, uh, I'm not sorry, uh, invasive species. Invasive species either swim, float, or hitchhike. 
to an area where they're not currently found. Uh, and so these treatment alternatives are the, are the ones that the Corps has identified that can help um, uh, eliminate or reduce the risk from swimming and floating. They have not found them. They do not include any type of technology for invasive species that hitchhike on boats, barges, that type of thing. It's, it's practically impossible to do that. Um, so what we have on here is the glimmerous lock concept where you force water in one end, and uh, clean water in one end, and dirty water in the, out the other. Uh, there's an Asian car, uh, aquatic nuisance species treatment plant where they would use uh, screens, uh, sand filter, and UV light. Um, and then the important thing here is, is that even though we have electrical barriers, what they're proposing is a little bit different concept, not just simply putting a barrier in a stream but actually building a channel where they can put in an electrical barrier and the core feels that this would be much more effective than, than what we have in the current barrier that's just simply in an open stream. Uh, next slide, Kathy. And as Joel mentioned, uh, these are the eight alternatives that um, the core is looking at. Um, and what we're going to do from an Asian carp perspective is we're going to take a look at the Glimmerous report and try to uh, tease out of it what we think would be appropriate for dealing specifically with Asian carp. Uh, Kathy, next slide. And so um, that, that is the process that we're going to be using. I'm sorry, this is not the, uh, I'm going to get into this subject in a minute the other pathways. But what we're doing from an Asian car perspective is looking at all these technologies and is there one specific aspect of a technology or technologies that we can use that would basically deal with the Asian carp issue. And even though we understand that the long-term goal of the Glimmerous process is to eliminate the movement of all species, we feel very strongly that we need to take a look at Asian carp in the short term. Next slide, Kathy. I also want to bring up that Glimmerous didn't just deal with um, the Chicago area waterway system. They did identify 18 other pathways um, where invasive species could move between the basins. And what we're doing right now is we're working with all of the state agencies um, and asking them to address each one of these. Some of these are, are um, uh, more risk than others. Uh, specifically, there's one in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is Eagle Marsh, and we're working with the, uh, the Indiana DNR and the local uh, agencies, and hopefully we will have a solution to that in the very near future. Uh, we're also working with Ohio DNR on a couple of key areas, which is Little Kilbuck Creek and the Ohio Erie Canal at Long Lake. Um, so we're actively working with all of the partners in the ACRCC to try to remove these permanently as, uh, as threats to invasive species and Asian carp. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank all of you again. Um, I, I know I ran through that very quickly. I was hoping we'd have time for questions and answers. So with that, I will turn it back over to Lisa. Okay. Thank you, Jim, for that presentation. And Senator Rest, I'm opening up your line, too. Um, we do have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Representative Patty Bellock asks, why don't we turn up the electricity in the barriers and put up signs warning fishermen? Um, if you want, uh, Lisa, I can handle that issue. Mm -hmm. um, right now, there are no, if you remember the map that I showed, there are no Asian carp near the barrier. Um, yes, if you can bring that up, right there. If you can see the barrier up on the right-hand side, um, and, and we do extensive monitoring both above and below that barrier, and we have documented that there are no Asian carp in that area. So we're working with the Corps right now to take a look at that specific issue as to whether or not we can turn it up. Um, because this is an area that's not a controlled area, if you start turning it up, uh, with, there may be consequences outside of the area. Um, it, this field that, it, that the electrical barrier creates is not just in the water. Um, it moves to the land area also, so we have to be very careful. And we have to be very careful that uh, it doesn't pose uh, uh, a threat to the barges and the barge owners uh, 
uh, the shippers that are moving through that area on a regular basis. But it is definitely something that the Corps is looking at right now. Okay, thank you. And now, um, does anybody have any questions specifically for Jim Breeden? If so, please raise your hand or type the question in the questions pane. Um, while we're waiting, I'm going to open up the line of Michigan Senator Darwin Boer, caucus vice chair. Senator Boer, your line's open. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, that's the first time I've been able to make it through, so that's, that's good. Uh, Jim? Uh, I'm from Everett, Michigan, the senator for the 35th Senate District, which has four counties on Lake Michigan. One of the areas that look, look like uh, Ludington area at, uh, across from where I live. Is that true? If you're doing some testing or checking in that area? Um, I wouldn't. I don't believe that it is Ludington, Senator, that we're working on right now. I think it's in the Grand Rapids area. Um, and only because what we what we feel is that if if there were any movement of Asian carp uh, through the Chicago River waterway system, they'd work their way up the shorelines of um, the Great Lakes. And so, what we would look at right now, we're we're targeting uh, the St. Joe River, uh, the Grand River, and I believe the Muskegon, because those would be the areas where that they would first see Asian carp if okay. they were to move up. Um, but yeah, I mean, we they, the Fish and Wildlife Service with the Michigan DNR, they are the ones that determine where this sampling will take place. Okay, uh, I appreciate that. I live on the Muske Everett's on the Muskegon River, so uh, that is a concern uh, for me too. Uh, let me ask you about your hitchhiking. Uh, can birds like the comoron, who eat a pound and a half a day on their migrating north, stop the thousands of them at Ludington in that area? Can they, can those uh, fish move that way? Um, what we've been concerned about is that the birds would actually move um, uh, eDNA or DNA from fish. Um, we're pretty certain that once a fish has gone through the gut of, of a bird, there's probably not much left. Um, but it does pose a real problem for us when we use eDNA um, to to um, to try to determine if, if there are live fish in an area, when we have things like the cormorants, um, eagles, that type of thing, um, that that may be depositing DNA, not necessarily live fish. Okay, uh, uh, am I off or I unmuted or I muted yet? So uh, you're you're back on, Senator Board. Did you have a follow up? No, uh, not for Jim. I had one for Joel uh, in, when he was presenting in the question. But uh, again, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, Madam Chairman, I, I'll uh, I'll try to get back with Joel later on a question on number five, his lakefront issue there. So I'll uh, I'll go back to that some other time. Thank you, Senator Boer. Well, I don't see any other questions or hands raised. Um, Senator Rest, I'll leave it up to you. Do we want to go back to Senator Boer for his question? Sure, I think I think we have time. Okay. All right, Senator Boer, your line is open. Okay, thank you very much. Again, Joel, uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I go down to the one you favored, number five, on the lakefront separation. Can you hear me, Joel? to open up not, there he is oh, oh there we go I'm happy to talk about that senator I, I was not uh, of any of the alternatives the core presented the one that's closest to something that, that we've supported has been number six the mid system separation okay six and five I thought was not too much different but maybe mm -hmm. maybe they are enough uh, but let's talk about five and if we in fact shut it off the water levels of the two billion gallons a day flowing through there that there wouldn't be an interruption to that or that has to that water all would stay within Lake Michigan well uh, no um, the, the the Chicago uh, drinking water supply and sewage system is, is highly engineered and so the in the scenario five in fact water would continue being pumped into northeastern Illinois 
uh, used, treated as sewage, and then discharged into the Illinois River. And so it wouldn't actually have any uh, effect, as I understand it, on the diversion of water away from Michigan. Uh, the six, in fact, though, does uh, propose reconnecting a, a large portion of the Chicago River system to Lake Michigan uh, and discharging, um, and, and, and also then um, discharging some water into Lake Michigan, depending on how you would implement that. And if, if that could be implemented in a way that would actually return water to Lake Michigan uh, instead of diverting some water to Lake Michigan instead of diverting it to the Illinois River. Okay. If, well, that would, to me, uh, our water levels are low, and probably getting the water levels up would be a good thing. But uh, on the other hand, how do you control, you know, when it gets too high? If, and that would be something I assume you're working on or would be working on if you did that. So uh, I think both looking at the study, myself, uh, the cost and the time. I mean, uh, the first time today I heard that we had uh, invasive species moving 12 different types down toward the Mississippi or would be going in. We're trying to fix that as well. I didn't, I didn't know until today that we had it going both ways here. Yeah, okay. that was a principle of the way this, the way this study was originally authorized, was on two-way prevention. Okay. Okay, I'm going to open it up. We have just one more question, um, and that's uh, from Minnesota Representative Paul Torkelson. Your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, just a question, I'm not sure, probably for Jim. Uh, we've invested pretty heavily here in Minnesota into research into the fish themselves, their physiology, how we might control the fish. Uh, could you update us on other research projects might be going on in the area? Um, sure, I can. Um, just very quickly, what we're, we're working very closely with Minnesota DNR. Um, they are on the ACRCC, so we work closely back and forth, uh, learning from what they're doing and they're learning from what we're doing. Um, like I mentioned, we are looking, we're, we're going to be field testing a number of things this year. Um, we, last year we, we uh, demonstrated a, an attractant, an algae that we can put out and bring fish in. Um, the hydro gun is something that uh, uh, I know uh, Minnesota DNR has been interested in. I think the concept that they're looking at now is more of an electrical barrier. Um, but you know, those are the things that, that we're trying to do is take what we're learning in the cause and move them to other areas that they can be used. So, um, like I mentioned, we also have a fish toxicant um, that we're hoping to start registration on in the next couple of years uh, to where we might be able to use it in the form of uh, something that where we can go in and kill fish, kill um, specifically Asian carp and no other fish. Uh, but that's what we're working on as of right now. Okay. All right. Thank you for that question. Um, Senator Rest, as soon as I can mute this line. Okay. I guess we'll go back to you, Senator Rest. Jim, I'm going to uh, mute your line for now. Um, once again, I want to thank both of our uh, speakers. And you see uh, uh, on the screen uh, a couple of announcements that we want to emphasize. Uh, to our members and other interested parties. We're planning additional webinars in March and May. We'll, in March, we'll be learning about nuclear waste in the Great Lakes region. And in early May, we'll have a roundup of legislation that could uh, directly or indirectly affect the Great Lakes. And we encourage caucus members who are sponsoring legislation uh, to share information uh, with us as part of that webinar. And they'll have an opportunity then to do so. Uh, this summer, I'm very excited that the caucus will be holding its 2014 annual meeting on July 24th and 25th in Quebec City. Uh, the National Assembly, uh, Assembly of Quebec uh, will be our host, and they are planning a very special reception and dinner on July 24th. Uh, the meeting itself will be all day long on July 25th. We'll have updates on drug grow programs and funding in both Canada and the U.S. Uh, presentations on the St. Lawrence River, the Waukesha Diversion as a text case of the Great Lakes Compacts, and some other topics. And in the, as in the past, we're 
planning to offer an optional site visit on the afternoon of July 24th. Uh, details for that will be available in the registration materials, which caucus members will receive by an email this coming Monday when our early bird registration period opens, and then general registration will open on March 17th. Finally, I want to remind legislators on the line that if you're not a member of the caucus, once again, you may enroll by visiting the caucus's website or the online enrollment link shown on this slide. It's free, uh, no cost, and it's open to all legislators from the eight U.S. Uh, Great Lakes states and the two Canadian uh, uh, provinces in the Great Lakes Basin. One of the uh, benefits of membership is that you may be eligible to receive a travel scholarship to help defray the cost of attending the annual meeting. We have a limited number of scholarships available. And uh, quite frankly, they go quite fast, fast. So I would encourage all legislators who are not yet members to sign up before Monday so that you'll receive the email announcement that Lisa will be sending out that day. And then uh, finally, uh, we are exploring a comment on Glimmerus. If you're interested, um, please contact uh, uh, Lisa with, um, with your suggestions. Lisa, back to you. Okay, thank you, Senator Rest. Remember, everyone, to watch for the follow-up message uh, with information on where to find the slides and the recording from today's webinar. Those will be available this afternoon. And please take a minute to fill out the short survey that will pop up as soon as we're done. I hope you'll join us again for a future webinar and that you'll let your colleagues know about this helpful resource for staying up to date on issues that affect the Great Lakes. This concludes our webinar. Have a great weekend, everyone.